So we are back now for the next and the last talk in this session. I welcome Dr. Ashok Krishnamurti from Calgary. Good morning to you mm -hmm. and welcome to your talk. So you will talk um, about spatiotemporal tracking of COVID-19 using open source gridded population rasters and mathematical modeling. You are active in creating mathematical models and you worked on project um, about Ebola before, for example, and um, we are interested to hear about your project and um, how your results can be used for decision making. So, Ashok, it's your... Thank you very much. Are you able to hear me, Astrid? And the rest of you, is my voice clear? Okay, I'm back. So, Ashok, um, I will put the screen, your screen also. Okay. Um, I, I will edit it to the live stream and you have to make sure that your slides are on the screen that you share. Right now, do you see it? Uh, yeah, that looks good. Okay, okay, so now we go. Okay, I'm gonna go full screen mode. And I will switch the present review to slideshow. Good morning, everyone. This is Ashok from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It's uh, 7.30 a.m. for us and a cool 8 degrees in the morning. So I'm sitting in my basement and uh, enjoying all the talks. FOSS 4G has been really nice for the past three days. And I hope you will enjoy my presentation as well. My background, I have a PhD from the University of Louisville in Kentucky in biostatistics. And uh, my expertise is in mathematical modeling of infectious disease epidemics. I work at the Mount Royal University. Calgary is located in Alberta. Um, and as you can see, um, I would like to begin by acknowledging all my research collaborators and my student research assistants who have spent a lot of time on this project. Here are the open source computing tools we currently use. But in this presentation, I'm specifically going to focus on the use of RStudio, the R Shiny app, QGIS, and WorldPop. If you are interested in downloading and installing R and RStudio, you can follow these links. And throughout these presentations, you will see these logos on the bottom, which means I would probably be switching from PowerPoint application to R, possibly to Jamboard, to Google Sheets, or to even a browser. R programming language was developed in 1991 by a couple of researchers by the name Robert Gentleman and Ross Ihaka. In its original version, they called it R and R, and then later on, they dropped one of the R. So R is an alternative implementation to the basic S language which is completely independent of the commercial version called S+. There are millions of users worldwide for R programming language. And if you are interested in knowing why R is so popular, well, there are plenty of resources. There are dozens of textbooks on statistical computing. But the most important of all, R programming language is free and open source. R program can be used for computationally intensive tasks where you can call upon C, C++ or Fortran code, and that can be directly linked to your code. But then R is just not a statistical tool. It can be extended to other areas via installing packages. By default install, R program comes with seven packages. But you can install additional packages by following this command, install.packages, and within double quotes, the package name. And then you can call the package as library package name. So the last I checked was, Yesterday, as of September 29, 2021, in the repository, the CRAN repository, as it's called, the Comprehensive R Archive Network has about 18,254 packages. Of course, all said and done, you might need a few dozen packages to download and use for specific statistical and mathematical purposes. So this, uh, this map here shows the global timeline of censuses. The lighter the shade, the more recent the census is. 
and the darker the shade closer to red is when the last census was done so if you put particular emphasis on this area here the northern africa and most of europe and if i zoom in today my focus will be on one of the lmic countries nigeria but if you look at countries like uzbekistan and somalia there a proper national census has not been done since 1980s and yet there are even countries which are fully gray like the democratic republic of congo which hasn't had a proper national census in more than 35 years due to the humanitarian conflicts and other geopolitical issues nigeria is one of the most populous country in the world with 206 million inhabitants i'd like to try and use my digital pen to draw on a map let me see okay well for some reason my digital pen is yeah there it is so here is a state called lagos it's a very tiny state if that state were to be a country on its own it will be the fifth largest economy of all of africa it's a financial hub for nigeria and it's a uh, it's where a lot of people live so in that particular state alone close to 10 million people live so we are interested in the population count for nigeria and we go to a place called world pop and download these geotiff rasters so we have started to compile these geotiff rasters for multiple countries and in this spreadsheet which i'm going to exit out of the powerpoint presentation and show you this spreadsheet has the geotiff data downloaded for 63 countries so for example if you look at uh, argentina there are these rasters which have close to 4,000 rows and 2,300 columns, which translates to roughly 9.5 million grid cells. Within the confines of each of these grid cells, you will have the population count. And we suggest a recommend, uh, recommended aggregation factor to do the dimensionality reduction. So if you don't want to work with such a huge data set, you can do the raster aggregation. So today my focus will be on Nigeria, which has about 1,100 rows and 1400 columns which results in 1.6 million grid cells i'm going to switch back to powerpoint yes so this google spreadsheet has information on many countries we keep adding more and more countries every single day in order to define what a raster is a raster is image is generally a rectangular grid of pixels with one or more numbers associated with it so in our case each grid cell has within the confines of the grid cell, a population count value. Now, many cells may have empty cells or simply replaced by NA, no data available or missing data. GIS data is commonly stored in raster format to encode geographic data as the pixel values. Um, so like I said, you go to worldpop.org, but you are able to download these geotiff rasters not just for population counts but you could also get information on uh, you know age and sex structures for any country in the world births uh, other informations are downloaded as rasters the brainchild for this world pop project is researchers from the university of South southampton but it's also heavily funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and collaborations with several other universities and industry partners from around the world. So for our purposes, we go ahead and download the year 2020 UN adjusted world population count. Of course, you have data sets to download for the year bracket 2000 to 2020. And you also have the resolution at three arc second versus 30 arc second. Depending on your computing power, you can choose what resolution you would like to download. Now, how are these geotiffs created? Well, this is a uh, this needs a lot of background work, meaning countries' censuses are taken and they, they are spatially disaggregated into gridded population. So I strongly encourage you to go to this page and they have a lot of references on how they use either a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach.
to convert national censuses to these gridded population rasters. So we have now selected the Nigeria raster for the year 2020 at the 30 arc second resolution. And like I mentioned, we have 1.6 million grid cells. We, we can view the raster using, say, a tool like QGIS. I've had my students put together these maps for me. You could also aggregate the raster, say, by a factor of 25 by 25. So each grid cell, which used to be one kilometer by one kilometer at the equator, is now 25 kilometers by 25 kilometers, approximately. So it's now 12.5 arc minute resolution. And this is how it looks in QGIS. Of course, we have other countries, you know, Spain, Brazil, and so on. You can play around with other countries if, you are, if your expertise is in QGIS. Now, in our program, you can import the GeoTIFF raster and you can work with the rasters and learn about the rasters. You can look at their resolution. You can look at the extent, coordinate reference system, the number of grid cells, and so on. But what you could do in our program is also to create a base plot. So what uh, we have written a function called create base plot where you give a country name and then you give your raster aggregation factor and then you whether you want it to be displayed in our studio interface or you also want it to be saved locally in the folder where the file is located. Now, at the end of this presentation, I'll share, you, share with you a Dropbox link which has all the R codes and this PowerPoint presentation also. So for Nigeria, when I use the create base plot, I get this image. This is the population count raster. And you can also use very many functions in the raster package, one of which is called aggregate. So this is how aggregation works. If I use an aggregation factor of 5, 5, so east, west, five grid cells, north, south, five grid cells, within the confines of each grid cell, you have the population count. So you can sum all of those values and put it into a single cell. So that's how aggregation work. For Nigeria, we use an aggregation factor of 25 by 25. So as you can see from 1.6 million grid cells, we went to 2,726 non-overlapping grid cells, where each grid cell is now approximately 25 kilometers by 25 kilometers at the equator. After aggregating, you can save your aggregated raster to one of very many formats. One popular format is called as the net CDF format. Of course, you can save it back to a TIFF file if you want, but your uh, net CDF file, you can use this write raster function. So net CDF file is called as the network common data form. And it's very popular in oceanography, meteorology, and uh, weather forecasting areas. So Panoply is one open source, free open source visualization tool for viewing net CDF files. You can go to this uh, website, gass.nasa.gov. It's freely offered by NASA. And Panoply offers a wide variety of map projections and the ability to work with different scale color tables. So, so as you will see, this map is projected using Panoply and there are 1.6 million grid cells here. You can also play around with your color, color palette. So on the bottom, as you can see, I'm using something called a Simmons Haxby, but there are dozens of color palettes that you could use. Panoply has a great advantage. You can zoom in to a greater extent. So as you can see in Nigeria, there is this Kainji reservoir where no people lives. So that's in gray color, meaning NA, that those cells are all filled with NA. In Panoply, the gridded raster can be viewed like this as a pixelated data, or you have an option to turn on interpolation and make it look more smoother. So toggling interpolation on and off does not really affect the data. It only changes the visualization from a more pixelated data to a more smooth data. You can also switch between the absolute scale to a log scale. So this is Panoply for you. So a review of key steps so far. You know, we downloaded the WorldPOP raster. We aggregated the raster to our convenience. We converted the raster to a NetCDF file and viewed using either our program or the NASA Panoply, or you can even use QGIS. So we call the initial population count as susceptibles. These are the virgin population, and you are going to seed some initial infections and let the mathematical model do its thing. So the spatiotemporal compartmental model we first adopt 
has two motivations. We just want to learn the full spatial dynamics of the disease spread as it spreads across not just network of connected cities, but a, a full-blown spatial model. So you can pick and choose any country you want, and you can run a fully spatiotemporal mathematical model. In this research, we try to seek mathematical ideas rather than to offer medic definitive medical answers. So we have our base raster layer. Now it's really up to the researcher on how many more layers they want to add. If you're running a simple SIR model, you just have SIR. If you're going to run a SEIR model, you'll have four compartments or four raster layers. So it's really up to the user. I put a bunch of question marks for the user to decide. Now, first we are going to run the SEIRD model. This is before vaccination was widely available. That is before December, uh, before January 1st, 2021. In this five compartmental model, you will see this people move from S to the exposed compartment whenever an infectious people and in, whenever infectious people and susceptible people come in contact. When this contact happens in a homogeneous mixing fashion, a fraction of the susceptible individual will move to the exposed compartment. If infectious people all lock down themselves and sit down at home and they don't meet susceptible people, this transmission will not happen. This movement from susceptible to exposed will not happen. So it really depends on how homogeneously susceptible and infectious people mix and based on a transmission rate beta, new incidents of exposures are generated per time step. So time step is really arbitrary. It could be one day, two days, one week, a bi week, and so on. Now, after a time delay, people in the exposed compartment move to the infectious compartment based on the average incubation period. So one hour gamma is the number of days they will remain in the exposed compartment. And then after a certain number of days of infectiousness, they either recover or unfortunately die due to the disease. So this is the basic SEIRD compartmental model. Now we are going to view this in a spatial context for the entire country of Nigeria. So we have now added four more raster layers. So we have constructed what is called as a raster stack. And we add two more additional layers. I'll talk to you what those two additional layers are. Um, in essence, we want to know if each of these grid cells are inhabitable or uninhabitable. So for example, these are water bodies. This is called as Gulf of Guinea. And we, these are neighboring countries. So we would want to make these countries or the neighboring cells to be uninhabitable. No offense, but we are going to focus our uh, simulations only in this country. No immigration, no migration, no emigration of any sorts. It, we are going to focus only on this country. So the mathematical model is as follows. We have these integral differential equations. If you discretize this, you will have your classical ordinary differential equations. And if you discretize it at a grid cell level, that's when you will get the ODEs. If you notice in this equation, there is an equilibrium maintained. All the equation entries will get canceled and the net is zero, meaning we don't allow for vital dynamics. There are no new births or disease related deaths, non-disease related deaths rather. So going back to the model, one of the most important things in the model is the weight function. This weight function depends on the human mobility patterns. How much of assumptions that you put into the model is very important because the models are only as good as the assumptions that you put in. How mobile is the society? On average, how many kilometers do we get out? Do Nigerians get out? So these are very difficult numbers to come up with. So if you want, you can define your effective area over which a susceptible individual makes contact in unit time with infectious individuals in a neighborhood. So if you are in a current cell, and if the cells are 25 kilometers by 25 kilometers, and the cell centroid is over here, a radius one is called as a Moore neighborhood that would take into the central cell and then eight cells surrounding it. This would say radius equal to two. This is radius equal to one. And like I said, it's called as the Moore neighborhood. Uh, these are more advanced neighborhoods. So this depends on how mobile the society is. And that will help us calculate the nearby infected. Nearby infected is called as the weighted sum of infectious individuals in the current cell 
along with the neighboring cells. We use that I tilde and multiply it by the susceptible population in the current cell divided by the number of people in the grid cell and multiplied by the transmission rate. Now here we can introduce stochasticity. Now it's striked out, but if you want to run a stochastic model, you don't have to be intimidated. It just have to be some probability distribution. Here we use a Poisson. If you strike it out, it's going to be called as a deterministic model. So here is a weight function which decays according to the Euclidean distance. So there is not much impact on infections from far away places to the current grid cell. So as I said, when you discretize the entire spatial model at a grid cell level, you get what are called as the ordinary differential equations. And we use these discrete time approximations to the underlying continuous time model. So it could be either a stochastic or a discrete formulation. For computer scientists, a pseudocode like this will be very helpful. How movement happens from one compartment to another. Now we're going to run a simulation from November through April. Midway, we are going to switch to vaccinations. So these are our boundary conditions. We have our susceptible population, the virgin population, and no infections. Then we seed some active cases based on data from the Nigerian Centers for Disease Control. So we, as of November 17th, in Nigeria, there are 37 states, including one federal capital territory. So these numbers can be downloaded from the NCDC website. And we seeded these cases. We also made an assumption that each one of these infections had exposed it to five more people, maybe in their workplace or their household or along the way their uh, transit. This is an assumption. You know, I've seen researchers where they say each infection has exposed to multiple people more, more than five times the active cases. And as you know, in November, there was no vaccination. So there is no initial vaccinated seeded. We run scenarios, baseline, strict mask wearing and social distancing and account for underreporting. Now, accounting for underreporting is probably the worst case scenario. Uh, a bit of caution there. We are not blaming any country of anything. This is the worst possible scenario. So I'm going to press play on three videos here, three MP4 animations as our simulation runs for, uh, I believe, 60 plus 120, 180 days. And as you will notice in the situation where there is uh, a lot of uh, restrictions, um, the social distancing is minimized, the human mobility patterns are contained, you are able to see there is close to a gradual disease fade out, if not a complete disease fade out. Whereas the accounting for underreporting is showing a lot of active cases. Now this map here is for one variable, the infectious variable. Quite uh, obviously you can come up with similar animations for any of the five compartments you know, the dead compartment, the recovered or the um, exposed and so on. Now here is a time series graphs of our projections. So we have to say projections, not predictions on what would likely happen. So the green one is the uh, scenario number two, blue scenario number one, which is the baseline. And scenario number three is the worst case scenario called as account for underreporting. Now we extend our SEIRD model to incorporate a vaccinated compartment. Now Nigeria has struck a deal with very many pharmaceutical companies, but to be honest, the vaccination campaign in Nigeria is very slow. As of yesterday, less than 1% of the population are fully vaccinated. So the vaccination effort um, is quite slow. So this is the mathematical model for the SVE IRD model. And we are going to now run a simulation from September through November. This is our projection on what would likely to happen. And this time we're going to run only with one scenario. And this is something I attributed to you just a minute ago that the fully vaccinated people out of 206 million people are 1.8 million. At least one dose have been administered to 4.6 million. So that is again, uh, not even 10%, that's about 5%. Oh no, not even 5%. That's 2.3% of the Nigerian population who have been administered at least one dose. And fully vaccinated is um, in fact less than 1%. So a lot of work to do. And this is the projection from 
And this time I turned off the interpolation. So you can, you're going to see a pixelated simulation. We seeded the active cases based on September 1st, and we are letting it run till November 30th. So as you can see, there are a couple of states here called as the Lagos and the reverse state. And this is the federal capital territory. These are the states we believe will have major hotspots going into November. And these may be used by public health officials to mount extraordinary efforts over there to contain the disease spread. Now, where do we stand comparison to the actual data? Our projections on the cumulative death says by November, you're reaching at about 5,000 uh, aggregated deaths in the country. But as of today, September 29th, uh, 2,702 deaths are reported. Our, our model is a little overshooting. It's close to 2,900 cumulative deaths. Once again, a quick recap. We download the GeoTIFF file from WorldPop. We aggregate it. We convert it into an HCDF file. We run the compartmental models and we view the geospatial maps using NASA Panoply. Now, over the past few days, we have moved away from to another application, Panoply. We thought, we let's keep everything within our program. So we are going to switch to what is called as an R Shiny application. And I believe I have a couple of minutes. So let me quickly show you. Oh, and this is uh, me running some base maps for Argentina. So as you can see here, if you upload your, if you import your raster to our program, you can generate these uh, base maps. But I'm going to quickly um, show you the R Shiny application that we are working on. And let me try to open it in a browser. Yes. So I'm going to run a simulation for the Czech Republic. And our future work includes clipping a particular province or a state for a country. Like for example, you might want, you might not want to run simulation for the entire country, you might want to clip out a certain province or state, like, you know, if I want to run only for Prague, I can do that, but that's a, still a work in progress. Now I'm going to run the simulations for the entire country. Now this is our shiny interface. All of this is, uh, the code is written, and when you run the code, you will have this GUI interface. So you get to choose one of the several countries from the dropdown, you get to choose your aggregation factor, you get to choose your model, Depending on the model choice, those model parameters will show up as sliders. So I'm going to say for uh, Czech Republic, let's say the average distance traveled on a daily basis is 15 kilometers. Let's keep the radius to two. And then let's say we run the simulation starting June 1st. One thing you need to upload is the seed data. As of June 1st, give me information on uh, the active cases, either by cities or uh, by regions in this case. So I'm going to browse and I'm going to grab a seed data. If you can just hold for a second and upload the seed data. It's all fully minute driven and user friendly and you can choose the number of days you want to run this. So let's say if you run it for 150 days and hit run simulation, it will uh, present all your summary. It, and these tabs will all be filled out with all sorts of plots. Now, in the interest of time, I already ran the simulation for 150 days. I'm going to show the results. With that, I will end my presentation. So that is over here. I ran this last night for 150 days for the Czech Republic. It dumps 150 images. And then it also puts out an Excel file with the summary. And we have an MP4 video. So you don't necessarily have to go to Panoply. So as you will see, this is running for 150 days for the Czech Republic. And here we use an aggregation factor of 10. So each grid cell is about, about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. And there you have it. So 150 time steps. It was pretty fast. The frame rate was pretty fast. But if you look at the um, summary data, I constructed a plot which I would like to sh showcase. And with that, I'll end my presentation. So this is the out output data. And then you have your projections. So we started on June 1st based on the data from the ground. And our projection by the end of October, we project that there will be uh, close to 44,000 to 45,000 
cumulative deaths in the country. Now we are here at uh, October 1st, almost October 1st, we are at 32,000. If left unmitigated, you're going to see widespread deaths in Czech Republic. That's based on the data as of June 1st. I mean, things could change quite fast if the vaccination rollout is speeded up. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you so much. Any questions? Hello, Ashok. So yeah, that was very good. Thanks for yeah. the presentation. And it was really impressive what your mathematical models can, can do. So big applause to Ashok. Thank you. And um, let's see. And I missed to, to mention that you are from Calgary, from the Mount Royal University. You're an associate professor there at the Department of Mathematics and Computers, Computing. And um, it would be interesting how, how big your team is that you are working together with. Absolutely. We have four uh, full-time faculty members and about uh, 10 undergraduate students. We are a primarily an undergraduate institution and we actively pro promote undergraduate research. So, um, yeah, I have a lot of students. A few students emailed me even a three, four hours ago. They were working very late on this project and mm -hmm. he helping me out with this presentation. So I do oh, okay. acknowledge my collaborators so we can greet them from here now absolutely it's good to see and yeah. and are you connected with with other uh, institutes because in these times of pandemic we are all sitting in the same absolutely. boat and um, so you can see these global connections growing and do you have it as well i do i for the nigeria project i have somebody from the university of port hardcore in the reverse state uh, her name is agatha she's one of the collaborators i acknowledge and for the Czech Republic, uh, the collaborator, has, his name is Bedrick Susidik. He is actually in the University of Maryland in Baltimore County, but he has uh, his personal views and background from the Czech Republic. He grew up there. So therefore, I have that kind of connection. Um, so yeah, I do have a couple of collaborations, one in the US and one in Nigeria. And we are yeah. actively looking for more collaborations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess these collaborations, they are so important because we grow with all these um, teamwork. And Absolutely. it was nice from you sharing all these um, software solutions and your um, calculations and the links to, to the places where you can get the data. And um, it looks like you can use it for every place in the world to Absolutely. make these predictions. And that was really impressive. Thank you I so really much. appreciate your Thank work. You, I've placed the link in the chat window. I don't know if the audience can see it. It's a Dropbox link for this particular presentation and some R code. No? Maybe, uh, Ashok, you could uh, publish it on Twitter. And after the conference, all the presentations will be published as video. And we will add your presentation there as well. So people can, can um, have, a, have a deeper look. Um, afterwards. Absolutely. So thanks Thank so again. And now we are at the end of this session. I hope you all enjoyed it. I can uh, recommend you the next talks. Um, the, we have keynotes approaching now and we have a big, great day at Phosphor-G um, on the way. And um, yes, enjoy Phosphor-G and see you later. Bye. You. Bye.